Und wir machen direkt weiter mit der nächsten Session ähm, mit Alison Wilbur. Es dreht sich um den Fußball in den USA, der definitiv einen größeren, immer größeren Stellenwert einnimmt. Und das hat auch immense Auswirkungen insgesamt auf den Frauenfußball. Wir möchten verstehen, was machen die USA anders und welche Rolle kann der College-Fußball dabei spielen? Das erfahren wir in der Session von Alison Wilbur. Diese Session ist auf Englisch und deswegen werde ich gleich auch ins Englische übergehen. Allerdings an dieser Stelle auch nochmal ein großes herzliches Willkommen an alle, die von der Republika jetzt auch auf Kanal 2 ähm, zu uns gestoßen sind. Herzlich willkommen. Alison Wilbur wird uns direkt zugeschaltet. Um, sie wurde... Hello, Alison, there you are. <laughs> okay, so we will go over to English now. You've been selected for the Women's Soccer Award of Excellence um, back in 2021, um, January 2021. So congratulations on this um, fantastic award. Um, and you have been the only soccer coach that the William Smith has ever known. Um, you built the Herons from the ground up into one of the most successful and widely respected programs in the nation. Along the way, you solidified the place amongst one of the legendary names of the collegiate soccer coaches. Um, including the 1988 and 2013 national championships. Um, you're the first woman in collegiate soccer history to earn 500 career wins, and her your 593rd wins put you in first place on the NCAA Division II, Division III women's soccer all-time list, and second among coaches in all divisions of women's soccer. That's a mouthful. It is fantastic to have you here at the Female Football Academy. Please do let us know where are you streaming in from? I'm streaming in from my office in Geneva, New York. It's in upstate New York State. Fantastic. Yeah. So great to have you here from New York. Um, yeah, we'd love to give the stage to you. I believe you've prepared um, a presentation, so it's all yours. Well, thank you. And uh, I think this uh, fe female Congress for uh, soccer is a fabulous idea, and I'm just happy to be a part of it. Um, my student athlete from Germany, from Berlin, um, Jana Kanika, kind of wrote me into this. So I hope I can deliver what you all are looking for. Um, and, and I have spent my entirety of my career at William Smith um, in Division Three, So I know that aspect of soccer best, but I um, have really tried to create in this PowerPoint for you all a comprehensive uh, look at women's soccer uh, in college and university in the US. So I'm, I'm going to start now. I, I think it's important um, that we understand the structure of uh, college in the US because it defines the parameters for how uh, our athletics uh, programs are organized. So we have two year schools, uh, often called junior colleges that uh, people get associate degrees from. And then we have our more common um, four year schools that are public and private. And then we have various uh, universities, schools offering postgraduate masters and doctoral degrees. So um, in, in our country, um, the college structure is such that athletes are allowed four years of playing eligibility, and they have to use these within five years. So this can be accomplished by a straight run through a four-year school, or you might attend a junior college, get your uh, two-year degree, and transfer to a, a four-year school. Or in other cases where somebody maybe has missed a, se a season of eligibility, they were injured, um, they started late, uh, they're able to finish that fourth year of eligibility either at their school in a graduate program or transfer to a different graduate school where they get that last year of eligibility. 
Now there are three major affiliations for university and college sport governance in the US and you see them here. So the NCA is by far the largest and um, one most commonly known, that's the National Collegiate Athletic Association. And I'll speak more specifically to the NCA later. That's who we belong to at, at my institution. The NAIA is a National Association of Intercollegiate Athletics, and that consists of approximately 300 schools uh, whose athletic budgets to be nationally competitive are about 40% smaller than the average nationally competitive uh, NCA school. They're often smaller, less academic schools, and many are reliant on international st students for their rosters. They have less recruiting rules and uh, less rules for training than do NCA institutions. Uh, schools who, NAI schools may move away from the NAI in an attempt to bolster uh, student enrollment. Oops, I'm going back. <laughs> so uh, junior college, I shouldn't forget them, consists of, for women, soccer consists of about 118 schools and they're separated into 24 regions across our country and into three divisions. So at the division one and two levels, they're allowed to give full scholarships, and this includes tuition, room, and board. At the D1 level, they're also allowed to give a one time a year travel uh, allotment, which I think could be a factor in attracting international students as it helps them get to this country. At the D3 levels in junior college, no athletic scholarship money exists. They also have looser governance in terms of training and recruiting than does the NCA. Now, a former player of mine coached several years as a head coach at a junior college, and she won three national titles. What she said to me was that the, there are significant challenges of developing and evolving teams tactically and technically because she only has them for two years. And she noted also the challenges of working with kids who just needed more time to grow up. Now I included this slide um, so you can get a geographic sense of the divisions in NCA um, across the country. So in the, in the states, most of the universities and, and colleges are on the Eastern half anyway. So that defines really what happens with athletics. But I think it's interesting if you look at uh, blue for division one and yellow for division two and the Western half, you see the geographic challenges for travel, which then of course affects budgets and uh, miss class time. So now let's look at um, division one where I think most people are focused at least initially. So there are about 350 schools in, in D1, and in the major and mid-major Division I schools, there's a vast amount of dollars uh, generated by their football and men's basketball programs. This is through attendance at games, you have huge fan bases, and TV revenue. So Title IX, which is our federal law that ensures women uh, have access to equitable opportunities to participate in sports and to have similar quality of experience in doing so. Title IX allows our female athletes to benefit from this lot of money that's invested in the men's programs. They get it too. So uh, because of that, they the, the women get um, benefits of like better facilities. So they might have their own stadiums, definitely have their own practice facilities. They have probably uh, their own athletic trainer, their own strength and conditioning coach, uh, much greater travel budgets at lower level and uh, D2, D3 schools like mine. For instance, here we share a game field with the men um, and we have three athletic trainers and two strength and conditioning coaches who are spread across 19 sports here, male and female. So there's a significant difference, I think, in support resource. Coaches' salaries are generally higher than in lower divisions. Um, Division one allows 14 full scholarships. So this is a big defining factor. These are full year rides for one year, are 
for uh, and one year awards and they're given to special players or for those who will anchor the team. Now these can be revoked because they're only one year. Um, and that can be tough on, on uh, students who thought they had uh, part of their education paid for when a coach says to them, well, I don't really see you playing very much uh, next year. So you might think about going someplace where you could play more, or if you stay here, you just won't be playing. So there's an honesty component there, but I think it, it also is, um, it provides some instability for the, for the students. So at the major levels uh, in D1, generally you'd find probably schools giving up four to six full scholarships and at mid or lower level D1s, probably three or four are full and the rest are all split into partial scholarships. There's a large range of quality within division one programs, just as there are in our other levels. The top programs in the country, um, probably in these, uh, I've been calling the majors, probably mostly come from the Power Five conferences. And that represents about 65 schools like Stanford, University of Southern California, Florida State, Notre Dame, Duke, North Carolina, et cetera. So these, these programs with huge recruiting uh, budgets and lots of cachet have access to really great greater pools of highly talented individuals. So people in the national pool, players who are top uh, international athletes. Um, so that means they have a higher level of competition, especially if they're in the same conference and their benches are quite deep and talented. Um, now, this is my opinion, but for a long time, especially in the years when North Carolina with, with Anson, who's still there, Dorrance, uh, was dominating one national championship after another, I think a great deal of emphasis was placed on athleticism, winning the 1v1 duels, and a lot on physical size. So power and aggression um, were really dominant characteristics of Division I play. And he, we tend to call that, at least at Division three or my school, we look at that and call it crash and bash. Um, and I think those characteristics are yet residual in, in many uh, Division I schools. It, it really is a, a mark of how games are, are coached uh, and, and athletes are trained. I think the, the higher, the majors have evolved more and, and are bringing more nuance uh, that's so great about soccer into their games. Now, D2 sits in the middle of NCA membership um, because their base is former NAI schools. They have that flavor with less restrictions around recruiting and training. The NCA allows them non-full scholarships, and these are used along the same lines as D1. Um, so they're just uh, an in-between uh, I think model students are attracted there because they, they like that status of, oh, there's athletic scholarships involved. Not that they're all getting them by any stretch, but um, it has a status that seems to permeate uh, our sports culture here. Uh, some may feel by going to division two, they're going to have access to playing time earlier than if they went to a division one school. And perhaps they also are attracted by the perception that there's a little more balance between their uh, athletic schedules for training, travel and competition and schoolwork. Division three is the largest membership of, of all. This is my division. And the greatest distinction here is that we are not allowed to give any athletic scholarships. We do give financial aid and based on a federally computed need scale, institutions may also give merit scholarships. So my player from Berlin uh, received a very nice uh, and prestigious merit scholarship at our school, um, but she won that based on her academic strength, not, not because anything with soccer could be factored into it. So in many cases, these financial awards are equal to or greater than the partial scholarships that D1 and 2 offer. The mission statement for D3 is clear as I show here. Student athletes are treated the same as other non-athletes. That's not always the case at um, Division I. 
Schools place importance on the impact of athletic engagement on the student athletes themselves, as opposed to the entertainment value of student athletes for other uh, residents of the campus community or the greater community. Athletics are viewed largely as a four-year experience as opposed to practices at some upper levels where those years are extended into five. As in other division, there is a vast range in quality from the top D3 schools to the lower levels. Generally at the lower levels, there's not a commitment of resources um, to uh, athletic programs. So it might be part-time coaches, part-time support staff. They're sharing facilities like crazy with other sports. The top schools here in division three can compete into the mid-majors of D1 and two. And at William Smith, we have players consistently in our program who got division one looks, but chose to come here because they wanted a broader overall college experience. I think they wanted um, a challenging soccer experience, but they didn't want that to supersede uh, their opportunity to be high achieving in the classroom. So how is uh, competition organized? So like so much in the NCA, we were handed men's basketball structure about 30 years ago. So conference play is the main driver. Schools compete largely within conference with conference playoffs at the end of regular season to determine who will get an automatic bid to the NCA championships. Schools generally try to schedule some out of conference play early in the season before the bulk of conference starts. Main season starts in mid to late August if you're D1 or 2 and September 1st for us at D3. And playoffs start around mid-November. If you make it through to Final Four, the NCAs, then, then they end in the first or second week of December. Now, there's strict rules regarding numbers of days or weeks that programs are allowed to train. So we all, every division is on a six day a week training competitive schedule, one day a week off is mandated. Division one and two are allowed 132 days of training competition to be utilized throughout the entire year, while D3 is given 21 weeks that we can never come close to. Um, and we're allowed 16 practice opportunities in the spring as our off season training. So here at William Smith, uh, because our aspirations are to maintain national standing, we have to be creative to stay within the rules but we need to maintain ongoing development. So within each week, 20 hours of CARA, so you, you see on the screen, countable athletically related activities uh, are allowed. So this includes all training, video sessions, team meetings, individual training, uh, strength and conditioning sessions with lift uh, strength coaches. It doesn't include travel to games or actual contest time or pre or post training um, preparation, um, taking care of your, your health. And after the 132 days are utilized, division one and two are allowed to implement eight hours more a week of CARA. So this includes, like I said, strength and conditioning, video meetings, et cetera. And it's a challenge for those schools. So how are they gonna split up those hours? Cause there's not that many. So these are, um, to keep, they wanna ensure that they have ongoing access to their student athletes and their development. So because they can apply care whenever school's in session, they might require students to attend classes in the summer in order to ensure that they have access to student, uh, to athlete training uh, throughout the summer. And because of that, it's possible for the division one, two student athletes to graduate in four years because they might not have been able to take four, four um, full course loads in the regular season of competition. And now, in, because they have to attend summer school, they can make up for some of that. Now, di men's division one soccer has been on a, a big mission to have the NCAA incorporate a split season model that would see play competition from late August to November and resume competition in February with playoffs in the late spring. So they're lobbying the NCA based on rationale of more recovery and preparation time between games, more access to developmental opportunities for their players in a year round setting. And they believe that for men, college soccer here in the States doesn't offer 
the developmental opportunities that are found in Europe, and they, they worry about losing their top talent overseas. The women's side, and this is contentious right now, is split on this at D Division I. Um, they're waiting to see if the men's model is passed by the NCA and how it goes. So some are fervently in favor of this, and others are not. The majority of the female Division I soccer players, when last surveyed, did not support this split model season. So getting your team to the NCAA playoffs is the major goal of all top level coaches, administrators, regardless of what division uh, your program belongs to. Competitive seasons can consist of up to 20 games. Here we only play uh, 16 in regular season because I hate midweek games. Um, it interferes with a run of practice and recovery, and just preparation in general. So teams winning their conference playoffs gain an automatic bid to the NCAA tournament, no matter how weak or how strong their conference is. Um, the NCAA is governed by college presidents, and they all wanted access to championship play. So I personally uh, don't support this notion. There's nothing... Um, the college president is a college president and, and they have the votes, but, you know, therefore it's not really a true championship in that the best teams are not always in the, in the championship. So I call it a tournament. Um, now the second way to the NCAA term is through an at large bid. And for division three, there are about 20 of those. And I believe it's vital in our scheduling so that we uh, schedule other top division three um, programs in other regions of the country so that we can um, build, begin to build up these criteria that I list on the bottom of this slide. So when it comes time to selection, they're gonna look at a, comp a compilation of what's your win-loss percentage overall? How good is your strength of schedule compared to uh, other teams? What are your results against ranked teams in your own region and other regions and ranked um, and against teams already selected into the tournament. So this basically is the same for every division. Um, I'm just showing you here. Uh, on the left, you see the bracket uh, from 2019, the last time we were allowed to play. And this was our trip to get to the national championship finals. So um, all of those games on there were played back to back in a weekend. So each bracketing was a back-to-back -back game. Um, that is also something that we're not really thrilled about at my level. Recruitment can be literally a full-time job and it is for many assistant coaches, especially at the upper levels. Rules frame everything we do. The NCAA rule book before it became digitized was almost 250 pages long for each division. And coaches have to pass a rules exam every year. So recruiting rules uh, for division one are by far the most comprehensive um, and most likely in response to the high stakes uh, that are in men's sports for winning. Um, there, it creates, a, I think, a landscape for rules violation potential. So uh, everybody else has got strict rules because of it. All divisions have timelines for when prospects can come to campus for official visits, how, when prospects can be co contacted, how their interests or intentions to ten, uh, attend can be publicized or not, what kinds of expenditures are allowed before they get to your program when they're in your program. Um, and at Division One and Two, they, all prospects must uh, qualify with a center of eligibility that ensures that they have the demonstrated background to be successful with a degree and that they can maintain and must maintain minimum academic standards and progress to their degree. So coaches seek to identify talent through a composite of options. So showcases, major tournaments are created expressly to give exposure for players to as many college coaches as possible. This entails a ton of money being spent um, by kids who go to play uh, on the clubs and by coaches and their recruiting budgets who have to travel to see them. Coaches want to see kids play more than once, especially if they're going to offer them scholarship money. So league play is important. Schools now are uh, 
pretty much universally offering ID clinics where kids will pay to come to your institution for a weekend or a day to play in front of the coaches at that institution. Um, many athletes use recruiting services and agencies to um, attract um, attention from um, prospective coaches for, for their interests. And certainly um, th that's a lot, lot of how international students uh, gain attention from coaches here. Um, the practice of verbally committing to uh, attend schools has become one that in my, from my perspective is dominant and detrimental. Notably, it's getting out of hand at, in women's soccer. So aggressive coaches were inducing players to verbally commit um, for college when they were, you know, in their freshman or sophomore years in high school. So essentially they're 14 to 16 years of age. And that's an age which, you know, doesn't allow kids to have many options or much time to explore what is college all about? What are, what are different colleges look like? What do they feel like? Uh, it doesn't allow for them to grow and change as we know teenage years are all about that. Um, so a verbal commit in most cases didn't do anything other than, doesn't do anything other than take these kids off the recruiting table. So it's not a lot of skin in the game for the coaches. And transfer rates became high because of it. Kids just found when they got there wasn't what they thought or they were ready for something different. Um, and that has trickled down. So it's um, permeated all through all divisions with um, girls thinking they have to have a verbal commitment sooner than later, or it says, that they're just not that good or they're not as good as their uh, teammates and their club teams. So the NCA is reining this practice back now by limiting division one and two in-person con uh, coaching contact um, or coaches contact with kids. It can't happen until after June 15th of their sophomore year. And something else that has changed some of the recruiting landscape in the past two years is the NCA creation of the transfer portal. So athletes wishing to perhaps play elsewhere or even momentarily unhappy with their role at their present institution can enter the transfer portal themselves and any coach is allowed to contact them once they show up on this. So it's a move that does protect the athlete from fearing of consequences should her, her coach find out she's looking elsewhere, but it also makes coaches feel very unsettled as to the stability of their rosters. Now, I included this because I thought you might be curious about what I call um, current trends in women's college soccer right now. So uh, we've had consistently greater um, access to research about varying aspects of performance and how these factor in to create best opportunities for, for winning. So employing analytics of competitive and uh, training performance is more and more employed. More and more teams with budgets are using devices with cameras like Trace or VO or GPS devices like Titan or Catapult. We have Titan and looking uh, to purchase either Trace or VO this fall. Many of us are investing in sleep education, countering an overall culture of college students who are persistently short on sleep. Greater awareness of the ports of rest and recovery have us questioning NCA limitations and structures. And at my level, we become disillusioned by the NCA statements of, quote, safeguarding the health and well being of our student athletes as a priority when the mandated time frames they give us for games, like I showed you the back to back games or a very compressed preseason, say something very different. Now, I'm not sure what the awareness and attention on mental health is in Germany, but here in the States is very high. So somehow our country has produced a, a generation of kids who are, from my perspective, very fragile and lacking in coping skills to deal with perceived stress and anxiety. They don't want to fail, and this creates pressure and more anxiety. And we in all divisions, oops, are, are spending more and more time counseling anxious kids and employing sports psychologists as we recognize how important this is. So do you want me to finish here at this point? I have yes, a thank you so much. It's been super insightful. If you want to wrap it up, that would be amazing. Uh, 
Uh, yes. So I think what I was um, really working to um, demonstrate is how comprehensive and how many layers there are to college soccer here um, for for both the coaches of, of the women's programs and for the athletes themselves. And um, and there are many choices for student athletes or for girls to um, select and, and a lot of things to consider when they um, begin to look at, you know, attending university. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Yeah, thank you so much, Allison. I think it's so interesting to look into, you know, how the U.S. system works because of this college system, because U.S. college sports is just like so much more um, integrated in the system. I myself um, born and raised here in Berlin, but I went to um, call it like university for a year in the United States. And I saw how that, um, you know, how sport was just like very, very present um, mm -hmm. in the university there. And you breaking it all down and showing how, um, you know, the path to um, or for women, for young girls, for um, athletes is, is extremely insightful. And I'm sure Germany and the rest of the world um, surely can, you know, learn a lot from that. Because we're running out of time right now, I'm afraid that we don't have time for another question. Um, but I wanted to thank you so much for preparing this very insightful and informative presentation and would suggest that anybody who would want to reach out to you probably can, right? Oh, absolutely. I'd love to hear from anybody with questions. Um, so Beautiful. we could, um, they have a way of finding me, of uh, my email address, I think. Um, would they be able to find you through um, your university yes. or college yeah, yeah. Yeah. email address? Okay, yes. great. Thank you so much right. for that. Amazing. Right. Have a beautiful Friday in New York. Okay, thank you so much.